We're going to be looking at a few texts this morning as we continue. The theme of the conference uh, has been conforming to the emotional life of Christ. And I decided and was told that some men finish up their series at the conference, others extend it into the weekend. So as I said, it was already truncated enough and so decided to preach both messages on that theme as well this weekend uh, on the Lord's Day. Mark chapter 1, if you will look with me at verse 40 through 45, we'll read the Word of God and then we'll get started. Mark 1, 40 to 45. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, and falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he sternly warned him, and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, because show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. Let's ask the Lord again for his blessing. Lord, we do thank you for your holy word. You're the one who's given it to us, and you're the one who can give us the understanding. We pray in the language of Scripture, you would open our minds that we might understand the Scriptures. And that, Lord, not only our hearts would be instructed, but our hearts would be warmed, our lives changed in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the Christian life is very much like walking down a narrow path. In fact, it's called the narrow way. But it's uh, certainly, from another angle, a narrow path. And you can imagine that there are two ditches on either side. The slightest movement to the left or to the right, and you're in a ditch. And what makes that more difficult is that sin has thrown us off balance. And one way that imbalance shows up in the Christian life is we have a tendency to overreact and overcorrect. And when we find ourselves in one ditch on the side of the path, we tend to overcorrect. And rather than coming back to the middle, we end up over in the other ditch. And I think we have that tendency because we can have a mistaken notion in our minds that the best way to get away from an extreme is to get as far away from it as possible. When in reality, you're really getting closer to the other error. I believe there was a Puritan I heard secondhand that said something like that. When reality, you, you, we need to get as far away as we can from that and you end up over on the other, uh, in the other extreme. So the, really the, rea- the, 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 the uh, focus of the Christian life so often is that we should be balanced as Christians. And this shows up even in our emotional lives. And no small part of our sanctification is bringing balance back to our humanity and even back to our emotions. And that's why both this morning and this evening we're going to consider the balance of our Lord's emotional life. Our dear brother Brian Borgman, Pastor Borgman, wrote this in his book, Feelings and Faith. He said, quote, once again, the Lord Jesus is also the pattern for emotional balance or symmetry. Now, for those of you who are not present at the men's conference, i just let you know, as I told them, we're not looking in detail at just individual and specific emotions that Christ experienced and expressed. Rather, we're doing some very broad brush strokes to sort of paint the big picture. So at the conference itself, we studied the boundaries of our Lord's emotional life, how the Word of God set the boundaries for the emotions that He experienced and how He handled them. Then we considered the boundaries of our Lord's emotional life. What was the iron at the bottom of the vessel that kept him from capsizing and that kept him true all the way to the end? Well, in the message this morning and again this evening, our focus, as I said, will be on the balance of our Lord's emotional life. So just consider this to be one long sermon with... uh, sort of three or four hours uh, intermission, okay? So that's a good way to promote the Sunday night sermon. Just leave people with a cliffhanger. So you'll have to come back tonight to get the whole thing. Now, what do I mean when I speak of balance in our Lord's emotional life? Well, here's what I mean. Our Lord always experienced the right emotion at the right time. And to the proper degree, 
in relationship to other emotions. Now that's a mouthful, so let me break it down for you in good Smith style, okay? Our Lord always ex expressed the right emotion at the right time. It was always the right emotional response called for by the situation. That's not true of us by nature, is it? Cain, why are you angry and why is your face gloomy? The implication, he had no business being angry, wrong response. He had no business with his face being sad. The Lord had to re rebuke the prophet Jonah for having compassion. Remember that? He had compassion on a plant while being angry at God for showing compassion on a city of penitent sinners. We are messed up by nature, and that even remains to a degree in the Christian life, so that we tend to experience and express the wrong emotion at the wrong time. That's never true of our Lord. He always had the right emotion at the right time. The second part of that is our Lord always expressed an emotion to the proper degree in relationship to other emotions, if you study the emotional life of Christ in the Gospels, you will see that he did not on every occasion just experience one emotion at a time. On several occasions, he experienced and expressed more than one emotion simultaneously in the same context. And one of the ways that sin has thrown us off balance is we tend to be all or nothing. Do you agree with that? We can express and experience an emotion to the negation of other emotions that should be there. We experience an emotion in the absence of other very important emotions. That would be a righteous response, but never true of the Lord Jesus. One emotion never negated another emotion that was appropriate at the moment. So that's what I mean by balance in our Lord's emotional life. He experienced the right emotion at the right time and always to the proper degree in relationship to other emotions. As we think about that in this hour, we're going to consider what I'm calling a perfect mixture or perfect mixtures. We're going to look at perfect mixtures. And then tonight we'll consider in alliterated fashion, pure motives. All right. So this morning we're going to consider perfect mixtures. And what we're going to do is we're going to examine a handful of incidents where we witness a mixture of emotions in our Lord. And it was perfect because it was without sin. And there are some things we should learn from these texts in our quest to be more like the Savior. And as we break this down, we'll just consider it under two very simple headings uh, this morning. Analysis and application. All right. Analysis and application. First of all, analysis. Let's begin by analyzing just a handful of texts where we see a perfect mixture of emotions in our Lord. And I think some of these you might even find to be, might even stun you and shock you. And I think you'll find it interesting. It's kind of a survey, Bible study way to preach this morning, but I think it's necessary for us to catch a glimpse of the balance in our Lord's emotional life. And the first text is the one that I just read in your hearing here in Mark chapter 1. Now when you come to this text, which emotion of Christ would you say is dominant? Which is the one that is prominently featured? Compassion. He saw this leper who wanted mercy from him and healing. And the Bible says that he was moved with compassion. That means to be moved in the innards. It is to feel sympathy for a person who is suffering so deeply that it can even register itself in your physical gut. You can feel it in your gut. He was moved with compassion. And what a display of compassion it was. Lepers were not to come near you. And you certainly didn't want to touch one. And yet our Lord Jesus, in the tenderness of his grace and his mercy, healed this, le this leper. Real compassion. This is real compassion. By the way, one of the things we learn about real compassion is that when it's present and it's possible, you always seek to bring relief to the sufferer. You don't just post sad faces and then challenge everyone else why they're not doing the same thing. Jesus would see something, feel something, and then he would do something when it was in his power to do so. But what I want you to especially take note of this morning in this incident is what we're told in verse 43. 
In verse 43, we read, I'm sorry, verse, yeah, verse 43, we read, and he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. Now the text says sternly warned. B.B. Warfield points out that warned is not actually a part of the terminology in the original text. It's translated this way probably in the text with the, I think the two blind men where Jesus sternly warns them as well. Now it perhaps could convey something of a warning or a stern warning, but if you reduce it to that, you may miss its effect and its full meaning. In the original, it literally means I snort or to snort. One source says to snort like an angry horse, to snort with rage. And in his article, B.B. Warfield, the emotion, when he, in his article, The Emotional Life of Our Lord, says that it could carry the idea that Jesus raged against the leper. It's a very strong word. Now, of course, that would not mean that our Lord lost his cool and control and began screaming at the leper at the top of his lungs and shook his fist in his face or threatened him in some carnal way, but neither should we downplay or sugarcoat the language. Evidently, it can mean displeasure, anger, or some kind of indignation that is coercive in nature. And perhaps that's where the idea of stern warning comes from. When you sternly warn someone, that has a threatening feel to it. You sort of get worked up and agitated. You show some form of displeasure and the person is taken back. And, and they feel pressure from that anger to take a certain course of action. And that's something of the, the, the tone and the feel of that term here. It's very powerful and strong. It's not just, hey, would you, would you please, now that you're healed, would you, would you please consider keeping it under the rug? Some way, somehow, Jesus manifested a real kind of holy displeasure at this man he had just healed. And we're told in verse 44... What Jesus uses this, what could be called a coercive displeasure to press this man to do. He says in verse 44, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer uh, for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And then in verse 40, 45, we have a clue as to why Jesus issued this angry directive. Jesus knew and anticipated that if news of this spread, it would create such a fervor and excitement that large crowds would grow to such an extent that it would be hard for him to get into the city, right into the city, and minister the gospel into the people. And as you read in verse 45, that's precisely what happened. Jesus had to stay out in unpopulated places. People had to come out to him rather than him going in to them. And along with that, it may be that Jesus wanted to keep this relatively quiet because such fame based on his miracles could perhaps solidify misguided messianic hopes that were inconsistent with his true mission. Now here's the picture though I want to paint for you. And I want you to see, this is an amazing act of our Lord's compassion. He loved this man. He had mercy on this man. And at the same time, it is mixed with an anger or displeasure toward the object of his compassion, coercing him not to do something. Now, due to our native tendency to emotional imbalance, there might be something in us that would say, would the real Jesus please stand up? How can you be compassionate towards someone while feeling this kind of displeasure toward them at the same moment and even show some form of threatening anger? And brethren, there are winds blowing in our day that are being felt even in the church that if applied to Jesus in this instance would lead us to conclude that he really didn't care about this man. He was just playing the part of Mr. Compassionate to further his agenda. And when he got ticked off, the real Jesus came to the surface. Because Jesus wasn't just affirming this man, was he? He was being coercive. He was showing some kind of displeasure. But unless we are prepared to indict the Son of God as a sinner, we are forced to conclude that this was a perfect blend of emotions. Emotions. 
He experienced and expressed the right emotion at the right moment to the proper degree in relationship to one another. And therefore, we must conclude that it is possible in a holy heart like Christ's to have real tender compassion to someone and yet also feel a holy indignation toward them at the same moment. And I need to add this observation. Did you happen to notice that Jesus displayed this anger or indignation toward the man before he had done anything? The man had not even breathed the word of this healing yet. And yet Jesus is already sternly saying, don't do it. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily that Jesus' omniscience is at play. I'm sure it is because he, you know, that we read of that in the Gospels. But it could just be also just the anticipation of what's likely to happen, at least in terms of application to us. Listen, there are occasions in which it is totally legitimate to give what we might call a pre-offense warning with a measure of holy indignation. To coerce someone away from an act that is not right or good or beneficial. Let me just give an example. My boy will be of driving age in about four years. So let's say for his 16th birthday that I buy him a used car. Because I'm compassionate. I realize he doesn't have enough money. He's trying to save for college and all of that. So we go down and get him a bucket of bolts. I mean a used car over at the used car lot. And we have it sitting in the driveway for him because he, he liked it when we went out to look. And so as when he gets up that morning and we hug and I say, now, son, you, I'll help you with some insurance. That's a little expensive. I'll help pay maybe a fourth to half of that. But you're going to have to get a job to keep repairs going and, you know, try to teach him about oil changes. You're going to have to keep gas in the vehicle. Now, would that be a display of a father's loving, compassionate heart? Now, but let's say that evening that we, I said, come out with me for a moment. And we sit down in the car and I said, you like this car? I said, yeah, you're going to really like driving this, aren't you? You're going to be the talk of your buddies, aren't you? Right. And then all of a sudden, he's thanking me, tears in his face. Dad, you're so loving. And then all of a sudden, my demeanor changes. My voice changes and deepens. My face scrooches up and I start to snort. All right. And I said, now look here, boy. The first time I ever catch you treating this car like you're trying to qualify for the Daytona 500. And she's parked until further notice. This can be reserved for your little sister. Now, he hasn't done anything. Why do you do that? Because I was 16 once. And his eyes are bugging out of his head. He hasn't done anything wrong. That's right. But sometimes when someone's especially in a position of authority, it's okay to show some anger to keep someone from doing something. If that's not true, then Jesus is a sinner. Now, that shouldn't be your daily diet of emotions. Don't, don't leave here today and blame on me that you feel liberated. You can just start raging at people. <laughs> Since we presuppose Christ's sinlessness, we have to conclude that we have here on display a perfect mixture of emotions. That's, that is very foreign to us. We don't know how those things go together often. Turn with me to another text, and it's John chapter 11. John 11. Where we have another example of perfect mixture. That we see a balance in our Lord's emotional life. Of course, John 11 this chapter is dedicated to our Lord raising his good friend Lazarus from the dead. You know the story. Jesus was sent by Mary and Martha, Lazarus' two sisters, because at that point Lazarus was just sick. Our Lord purposefully delays for two days, lets his good friend die rather than healing him and raising him from the bed of sickness. Our Lord does this on purpose according to verse 4 because he wants them to see the glory of God to a degree that they wouldn't see if he were to just merely raise Lazarus from the sick bed. And as the story reaches its climax, we see another mixture of emotions in our Lord, this time more than two. Look down with me at verse 32 and follow along as I read to verse 36. 
Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. And you know the rest of the story. Now, when we read in verse 32 that Jesus was deeply moved in spirit, that's the same word that we just saw in Mark 143. Jesus raging against the leper. And what we're being told is that when he saw Mary and the others weeping, he had some kind of holy anger or displeasure or indignation in his heart as he was about to come raise his good friend from the dead. And remember, he loves all these people. And then he says, the Bible says, his soul was troubled. And so he was agitated within his own heart at the same time. Now, why in the world would Jesus feel anger, displeasure in a situation like this? I mean, you just don't normally think about that. You know, I went to the funeral home the other day. It was so sad, but I was so mad. You just don't normally put those two things together, right? Does it, like those shouldn't be in the same heart at the same time, maybe three hours apart, but not in the same moment. Well, one way this is interpreted is that Jesus was anger, angry and troubled over the cause of Mary's weeping and that of the others with her. A.W. Pink captures this thought well when he writes, In this instance the Holy Spirit has recorded the cause of Christ's groaning. It was the sight of Mary and her comforters weeping. He was here in the midst of a groaning creation which sighed and travailed over that which sin had brought in. And this he felt acutely. The original suggests that he was distressed to the extremest degree, moved to a holy indignation and sorrow at the terrific brood which sin had borne, agitated by a righteous detestation at what evil had wrought in the world. So that interpretation is that Jesus was angry at death and he was angry because of what sin had done to the human race, bringing about such a tragic end of a life and, and all the sorrow and weeping that we were not designed to experience in this world. But it's not out of the realm of possibility to interpret Jesus' righteous indignation to be directed at Mary and the others for their unbelief. Now, before you balk at that, look down again at verse 37. But some of them said, Could not this man who have opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? What is that? I believe that's an expression of unbelief, at least a measure of it. Then in verse 38, right after that, we read, So Jesus again being deeply moved within, same word, for the anger and the displeasure we've been looking at, came to the tomb. In other words, it is possible to interpret this as Jesus was angry at the unbelief being displayed in this instance. Now, to balk at that idea that Jesus could experience an anger toward those that he was also loving and grieving for reveals a couple of things about us. First, it reveals how insensitive we are to the nature of unbelief. Unbelief, even the remains of it in the believer, is an assault on God's character and power. Second, it reveals how little we understand Jesus' holy soul and what it must have been like for his sinless heart to come into direct contact with the moral evil of unbelief. There was some measure of unbelief going on in this story, and it could be interpreted that Jesus had a holy anger toward it while he was also loving these people and weeping with them. Turn over, just to, turn over to Mark 9 just for a moment where we see just how frustrated Jesus could get 
at unbelief. We always tend to think that frustration must be sinful and unchristlike. Well, then Jesus was not Christ-like. Here in Mark 9, we have the account of the demon-possessed boy foaming at the mouth, slamming him to the ground, making him stiff as a board, throwing him into the fire, into the water. His desperate father turns to Jesus' disciples for help. Of course, they don't end up have they end up not being able to cast out the demons. And look at Jesus' response in Mark 9 and verse 19. And he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? Now do you think Jesus said, guys, how long? <laughs> how long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. You ever, you ever done that? Listen, hey, hey, just, just, hey, just bring it to me. And they brought the boy, and of course he was healed. Now, this may not be, we don't, we're not told that this was an expression of anger. We're not told of a particular emotion, but there's no way to read this without reading emotion into it. When Jesus says, how much longer do I have to spend my time in the company of unbelieving people? It's getting to me. I'm getting wearied of having to put up with you. That doesn't sound like Christ, does it? Because we have preconceived notions when we come to the Scriptures. How long? This was burdening our Lord's soul. And that's a picture of our Lord's holy soul being agitated as He comes into contact with unbelief. So as we think about John chapter 11, it is not out of the realm of possibility to interpret it as Jesus having anger at unbelieving people. Even people he loved. And you know what? Maybe it's both. He was angry at death and the curse and what sin had done. But he was also angry at the unbelief that brought the whole mess to, to begin with back in Genesis chapter 3. And that he now sees operating even in the hearts of some of his own people. And one more note about this passage in John chapter 11. There's that very short and famous verse Verse 35, where we read, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Now, the age-old question is what? Why did Jesus weep? Now, it's been suggested that it can't be because Lazarus is dead. You ever heard that? It can't be that he's weeping over Lazarus' death because he knows he's about to live again in a few minutes. So, there's no way that Jesus could be weeping. So Jesus must be weeping because of the sorrow of others and what death had done to them and to their loved one. Well, personally, I think it's best to let the next verse uh, at face value tell us why Jesus was weeping. Right after verse 35, we read, so the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. I think that's the interpretation. Why was Jesus weeping? He was crying over the death of his good friend. Why can't it be both? Why can't he be weeping for the, for the sorrow of the family and the friends and also be weeping for his friend who was dead? May I suggest that we don't have to choose between the two. Why? Because our Lord here gives us a great example of what it means to sorrow, but to sorrow not as those who have no hope. He had hope of the resurrection, but he could also weep at the present death of his friend. Our native imbalance tends, us, tends to make us go through extremes, right? Well, if you have hope, why are you crying? Or our tears cause us to lose sight of our hope, but not our Lord. Perfect mixture. Hope and grief at the same time. Time. So in one scene, we see love, anger, agitation of soul, sorrow, hope coursing through our Lord's holy soul. Then one more example, one more, and then we'll break off for some applications and then come back tonight to say more about this. Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10. Now there's only one emotion mentioned in this text, but I'm using it and you'll see why in just a moment. Mark, Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16. 
and they were bringing children to him so that they might touch them. So he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. Now, if you're a parent, do you bring your children to be blessed by an ogre? Do you, do you bring your children to be blessed by a man that has an intimidating presence and scowl in his face and his eyebrows are always scooch down? It's always snorting. Do you do that? No, you keep them as far away as possible. Just keep walking, kids. <laughs> this pictures our Lord as a very warm, inviting man who loved children. Can't you see him in your mind's eye as parents are bringing their children to him and he's smiling and he's cooing at them and maybe tossing them up in the air and Miss Jones, God has blessed you with such wonderful children. But in the midst of all that love and delight, Jesus becomes angry, delivers a rebuke, and then goes right back to that warm and inviting presence to children. And apparently it didn't scare the parents away. You guys stop. Let them come. For such is the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, we learn from Jesus here that not all rebukes should be done privately. This was no doubt embarrassing to the disciples to have an angry rebuke in front of other adults. But you know what? It was completely righteous or Jesus sinned. Now, brethren, those are three examples of our Lord's balanced emotional life, instances of perfect mixtures. Would you agree with that? And would you agree that they don't seem native to us? Well, the plan is to come back this evening to consider pure motives. And we'll see that in order to conform to this aspect of our Lord's emotional life, we must have pure motives. Jesus didn't pre did not pre-program these responses as robotic. He didn't say, listen, in this kind of situation, it's God's will for me to be sad. So be sad. No, they flowed naturally out of a heart that had right motives because of what he valued and what was important to him. We'll talk about that and open that up from the scriptures. But for now, having done our analysis, I want to bring this to a conclusion this morning by focusing our attention on some applications. We've done analysis, now some applications. Some initial applications from what we've studied this morning that can help us toward conforming to the balanced emotional life of our Lord. First of all, from what we've seen this morning, let me exhort you in this. Do not build your doctrine of Christ likeness on one or two characteristics of Christ based on just one or two key verses of Scripture. Don't build your doctrine of Christ on one or two characteristics of Christ based on one or two supposed key texts of Scripture. Now, I recognize that there are some aspects of our Lord's emotional life that are more dominant than others. Certainly, anger is not a dominant aspect of our Lord's emotional life that we find in Scripture. When we think of those dominant emotions, we think of love. We think of compassion. And should we be surprised that we find a lot of sorrow in our Lord since he's called what? Man of sorrows. What a name for the son of God who came. Yet we, at the same time, we must accept the entire testimony of Christ's character, including his emotional responses. If we are to have a full and solid doctrine of what being like Christ means. And I would exhort you. To beware of any approach that would look to one or two verses of Scripture that, quote, really get to the core of who Christ was. I don't believe it is sound to take one or two verses of Scripture and to take one or two characteristics of Jesus and try to understand the fullness of Jesus through that grid. I don't think that's legitimate. Or try to filter it and somehow, in some way, try to understand the other aspects of Christ. We need to take every verse of the Gospels. God has given us four Gospels, full of witness of our Lord. And we need every piece of the puzzle to have an accurate picture and an accurate por portrait. And I make this application for this simple reason. 
If you have an imbalanced view of Christ, and you have an imbalanced view of Christ's likeness, what's going to result in your Christian life? Based on the imitation principle. You will reproduce that imbalanced understanding in your own life. Which naturally leads to the second application. I challenge you to evaluate your emotional life in light of the influences which have shaped it. I really want you to th if you have time, just if, if before the Lord, or if you want to weave something into your devotions, you don't have to do this. This is not thus saith the Lord. But I challenge you to actually think about your emotional life and to think about all of the influences that have shaped you in that. Now, I said at the beginning of the message that basically we come into this world imbalanced emotionally in other ways. And I must add that from the moment you came into the world, you had influences which shaped your emotional life, some good, some not so good, some bad, and some really bad. And I judge it wise to reflect on your emotional life and the influence that have shaped it, because I believe it can be helpful in conforming to the emotional life of Christ. And here's why I say that. Let's say, for instance, that you were reared in a very nominal Christian home, Christian by name only. And let's just say that you grew up attending a very liberal church. If you never hear again how we ought to be the hands and feet of Jesus, it'll be too soon. Why? Because Jesus was presented week after week as nothing more than a weak kneed, milk toast Nazarene who loved people too much to ever rebuke, warn, and who would certainly never condemn for your choices. And so really the whole focus is just be compassionate to the community and do good works. And that's, we just kind of need to be the gospel and so the portrait of Christ composed for you is that Jesus who always has a smile on his face. And some reared in that kind of environment go on to pass it on to the next generation. But maybe the Lord was pleased to save you out of that mess. And if you never hear again any kind of emphasis in that way whatsoever, you'd be happy. Well, the problem is, is you've overcorrected so that you now tend to be drawn and attracted almost exclusively, if not exclusively, to those sharper edges of gospel truth and those aspects of Jesus Christ which correspond to them. So that when you read Jesus putting a whip together and turning over tables and driving people out of the temple, you say, now that's my Jesus. That's a man's man there, taking care of business. I mean, Jesus would draw the line in the sand. You were with him or you were against him. You just love that kind of raw meat stuff. And you tend to be attracted to those teachings of our Lord where he pronounces woes and judgments. But those incidents and teachings which reveal the more tender side of Christ... They just don't do that much for you. You just kind of read past those in devotions, or if you find those on sermon audio, you uh, skip over them, or your pastor's preaching, you just go to your happy place for an hour and shake his hand at the door. And I'd say, and I put this in my notes early this morning, young men, be, beware, beware of, a, of always having a steady diet of listening to ministries whose focus is almost always on false professions of faith, exposing what's wrong with the church. If that's your main diet, it will put a sharp edge on your personality and on your emotions. I appreciate those ministries. I, they have their place. God used that kind of stuff. You heard my testimony this morning. I'm glad there are people that have the sharper edges. But you, I think young men, especially in this generation, can fall prey to that to where they're always, oh, did you listen to this? You listen to this. And it's always that sharper edge, drawing the line in the sand, Jesus clearing the temple, and the church needs to repent. And, and you kind of suspect of any preacher that might preach on love is patient and kind. So be careful about that. But you see, we've all had influences that can shape us and move us in those directions. But let's say there's another person who was reared in a true Christian home in a fairly sound church home context. But the portrait of Jesus painted for you was almost exclusively one who was full of truth, but not very much full of grace. 
who promoted truth and righteousness with a backbone of steel and never compromised. And so you grew up with seeing Jesus as super strict with very little compassion. You love your parents, but as you look back at them, you say they were true Christians, but there was not a whole lot of warmth. There was just kind of buck up and get the troops ready. And it was just kind of, it was always, this is what's right. And this is what is right with very little tenderness. And rather than growing up to pass that along, you've determined, not me. Nope, nope, nope. It's going to be different with me. The problem, you've overcorrected. And now you tend to be exclusively attracted to, he doesn't cry out in the streets. The bruised reed he will not break. The smoldering wick he will not, uh, he will not blow out. Come to me, I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you say, now that's Christ. That sums up the Jesus I know. And so when your husband sternly warns your kids, you say, honey, honey, no, no, that's not Christ-like. That's not like Jesus. They haven't even done anything wrong yet. Yeah, but honey, I've been a boy. <laughs> so you shy away and you feel uncomfortable with those incidents and teachings where Christ has a measure of sternness and clarity. You, you like the fact that he's the Lamb of God, but you're just not so sure about the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You like the tenderness, but you don't like the roar. And that has greatly shaped your emotional life. Now, you may not fit into one of those two categories exactly, but you get the point. The point is that it's good to analyze our emotional lives and detect the imbalances and ask, what have been the influences that have shaped me? And have honest dealings with the Lord and ask for grace to face those aspects of Jesus revealed in the gospel that rub you the wrong way. And say, Lord Jesus, reproduce that in me. Help me to be more balanced. Asking yourself, why do I feel uncomfortable with the tender, compassionate Christ? Why does that just not register with me? Why do I not, why do I, why is there something in me that says, Pastor Jeff must have exegeted these scriptures the wrong way? That can't really mean that he raged against the leper. What's going on in there? And to have honest dealings with the Lord and ask for grace to bring you to the middle of the path. And then the third and final word of application is this. As you continue to grow in likeness to Christ, don't conclude that something's wrong with you when you increasingly experience what seems to be contradictory emotions. As you grow in likeness to Christ, you will experience at times what appears to be a strange contradiction of feelings in your soul. For example, if you grow in your love for God and commitment to His glory, there is no way that you're not going to be angry at times. How can His name be blasphemed in this fallen world and if you love Him and it doesn't agitate your soul? There are going to be times when your love for your children and others are so strong as it grows that the choices they're making are making you sorrowful, but also producing a holy anger at the same time. Don't be shocked that as your hope grows, that you can weep in very deep and profound ways. Don't we see this in the New Testament when it says we are to sorrow? And as I mentioned earlier, but sorrow is what? Those who have no hope. Or what about what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 6? He says, you're rejoicing, greatly rejoicing in these things. But if need be right now, you're in heaviness. And I don't think he's saying your rejoicing has been interrupted. We can get back to rejoicing later. I think he's saying you're simultaneously experiencing deep joy and deep grief at the same time. And the more you grow in grace, the more you're going to have these experiences of emotions that seem contradictory. But they're really not. That's growing in grace. Growing in grace like our Lord. I want to end by asking, have you ever had serious dealings with the Jesus presented in the Gospels? I mean, part of this whole thing of dealing with the emotional life of Christ is it's making us go to the Gospels and ask, who, Jesus, who was Jesus really? What was he like? Because you have a modern kind of a worldly perception of Jesus in some way or the other. And I ask, have you ever met and had personal dealings with this Christ? Have you?
Have you ever come to him in saving faith? Because this is where this begins. This is not moralism. This is not five steps. It, wouldn't it be better if ever, wouldn't the world be better if more people lived like Jesus? That's not the gospel. He's a savior from sin. And you'll never be able to imitate him effectively and truly until he has done a work of grace in your heart and liberated you. And we'll talk about that a little tonight about the work of grace he does in our hearts, which enables us to be like him more and more as Christians. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We pray, Lord, that you would take this word and we pray that you'd write it upon our hearts. We pray you'd give us understanding. Lord, help each of us have personal dealings with you. Lord, knowing that our emotions are always moral because they come from our hearts. And we pray that we would look at the Jesus of the New Testament and compare ourselves to him, to be humbled by it, Lord, but to also be encouraged that by your grace, we can become more like you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.